Good unspecified time to everybody out there in space. My name is... I want to say Sir Richard, but I think legally I can't, so just Richard. Uh, and I am Carl with a K. I can definitely legally say that. And welcome to today's episode. We intend to deep dive through Planet Popstar, the lands of Shiver Star, and our various experiences through the Kirby franchise today. But first, what's new with Carl in your isolation? Um, well, uh, I have a garden hose, uh, but I currently don't have a, uh, a way to store the garden hose really properly. Uh, but through the power of YouTube, I realized, uh, you can just like make bearings using, uh, wooden rings and marbles. Uh, so, uh, I'm planning on going on and buying some marbles to try and see if I make some wooden bearings to create a, uh, a solution to roll up my, my garden hose when I get back home, that is. That is fascinating and is always completely unaccept uh, unexpected. <laughs> completely unacceptable. Nobody uses marbles for that. I mean, to be fair, finding uses for marbles. Like, I feel like marbles are one of those things they produce so many much of at the start of time. That no one's actually made a marble in the last 30 years, and they just all exist. That is a good question. <laughs> like, are marbles still being made? Like, but that's not really on point. No, but marble tracks are fantastic. Uh, what's new with Richard? So I've been commissioned to do a poetry portfolio. Well, not commissioned, more it's an assignment to have coming up. And one of the assignments is pick an animal and stare at it for an hour and write a poem. So I put out a web survey about it to see what people like more between raccoons, ferrets, and cats, with a write-in option below. And I was very happy that someone wrote in chinchilla. Chinchilla? Chinchillas are a fantastic animal. I mean, I have a cat so I could just stare at him for an hour like I do most days, but that almost feels disingenuous to the assignment at that point. Well, I mean, where are you going to find a chinchilla to stare at for an hour? The internet? Zoos have live cams? I will be like, zoo live cam chinchilla and be very surprised if I don't find one. Huh. Right? I never thought to look up a zoo live cam. Right? I also <clears> briefly <throat> consider doing dick dicks, which are adorable tiny deer-like creatures. Uh, e yeah, uh, the innuendos are endless. Moving on from that... Another piece of the assignment was to do a persona poem, where I had to write from the point of view of a character. So I, like, attempted to do a pseudo-sonnet because I was too lazy to follow the badum completely, because itamic patameter feels like a bit much for an intro class. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. But I did write this on behalf of Joan of Arc, but I have slight regrets that I didn't do something more, like, campy and out there. Like, the example poem was from a first-person Hulk poem. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> that but, is uh, that is much more exciting than Joan of Arc. Which, I mean, gave me a lot to work with, but I could have done Kirby, and I still might, which I feel like is a perfect pivot into our topic. <laughs> Although, I briefly considered using Marvels to pivot in, because they most definitely had the DS games with the whole novelty of you can draw on a screen, so you should make Kirby a majestic rainbow course. Uh, Yeah, the, the rainbow canvas. I believe that one was the... All right, so here's a brief history of the character known as Kirby. So I'll let you ask first, do you want the lore description or the reality description? Ooh, let's go with the, the reality description because that's actually pretty funny. So they made a fantastic platforming game once upon a time, but they didn't know what character sprite to use, so they put a generic pink blob as a filler. Then they drew a smiley face on it and Kirby was born. Feel free to chime in if I missed any details there, because I think that was the entire story. As, as far as I know, I mean, I don't have any citations or anything at this exact moment, but that, that is my understanding, is that the original Kirby was actually just a, a placeholder sprite, uh, and then they completed the game and decided that he was adorable with a smiley face on him. <laughs> uh, that is delightful. But one of my personal favorite tropes, shout out to tvtropes.org, not a sponsor, just a fan, where... Mm. The Kirby trope of angry eyebrow Kirby, where when they moved Kirby to North America, they literally just drew two black lines on him to make his face more intense, was the birth <laughs> of the cute Fury aesthetic. Fury, not furry. The correct number of R's here directly determines the statement. 
Mm -hmm. And just... So, I did some deep diving into Kirby lore before our episode today. So, would you believe me if I told you that Kirby is what happens when you try and birth an evil eldritch god out of the negative emotions of mankind, but instead you put in positive emotions? I would believe you, but I didn't realize that the lore was that in intense. So apparently, 90% of Kirby lore is hidden behind loading screen title cards or the little enemy description cards that happen. Yeah, okay. And the premise is, in the first Kirby game, you're like, oh, King Dedede he stole the food. I think that was the first Kirby game. Uh, that was like the first like three or four Kirby games. But... It's usually King DD is possessed by some amorphous darkness of despair in some way, shape, right. or form. So it turns mm -hmm. out that amorphous darkness, when it condenses into a horrifying eye-bleeding death monster, right. is actually made of the same substance as Kirby. But huh. Kirby is the positive reflection of it. So as the darkness is darkness that spreads everywhere, Kirby is a ball with darkness inside it that draws in things. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. <clears throat> and I mean... Um, oh. <laughs> so then, uh, what to do with the Star Rod? So the Star Rod... So apparently we go back, there was a, two races of ancient beings. This is also mm -hmm. mostly found between the cutscenes and a little bit in the new Kirby Triple Deluxe game. Mm -hmm. So there's two races. One was a science-focused race. And one was a magic uh, orchestra. Whoa, 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 oh. whoa, whoa, whoa. The science race, is that is that Megalore? I will get there, but yes. Oh, damn you, Megalore. <laughs> I am so happy. So, to cut away, because this is far more important than the lore explanation. So, me and my esteemed colleague were playing through Kirby Return to uh, Dream End for Wii. Yeah, definitely one of the best titles in the series. Not the best, but pretty close. I might actually... Oh, man, it's tough to say if that's at first or not. <clears throat> it's real good. Mm -hmm. So, to continue with this, I heard Megalore say a phrase that triggers me in my soul of together we can do great things a thing that is phrase that is said almost primarily by villains particularly <laughs> villains who are trying to groom the hero into being a villain like this is mm -hmm. a Emperor Palpatine a Darth Vader a Voldemort maybe citation needed I I I, I wonder uh, if that's actually even, like, if you could find that as a TV trope. But but that's a, that's a segue for, for another segue. Oh, man. Like, the full <laughs> TV trope episode is coming. It's going to be great. <laughs> Where we just explain some of these tropes in their beautiful naming sense. Uh, I could give a full episode on the TV trope, The Woman in the Fridge. But I digress. So, Megalord... I, I, oh. I, I have to say, uh, I mean... <clears throat> The, you were right on the money about about that that phrase, but but I refuse to believe you. Like Megalore just seemed like such a nice guy. Like he, he just needed help building, re fixing his ship up. And so I proclaimed he is going to betray us. The moment I heard that line, I'm like, this guy. We're collecting power cells for a spaceship. He's going to leave us stranded on an asteroid to die. He's going to turn into a giant <laughs> Kafka-style Final Fantasy boss, Eldritch Horror, and he is going to murder us. So, fast forward to like 12 stages later, we've built, rebuilt our spaceship because we're playing that game not like speedrunners, but like explorers. To the point mm -hmm. with the famous catchphrase that Carl coined for me of, well, didn't get the secret, have to kill myself. <laughs> Sometimes it's the only way. <laughs> so, as we go on this adventure and we defeat the dramatic four headed dragon boss the adorable four dragon boss, Megalore waltzes up, and of course he goes, Wahaha! You have fallen for my trap! And he swipes the crown off the dragon boss, becomes Darth Megalore, as I how to the void called it. <laughs> no, no, not Megalore. Uh -huh. I think because I flagged him as sus so early on, you got so like committed to defending Megalore, because I knew, I knew he was going to betray us. And not only after he uh, betrays us is it heart-wrenching, it also, like, spikes the game's entire difficulty, too. Like, the game wants to then punish you for believing in him. Which loops back to my Kirby lore. So we got our two ancient races. The ancient science race, responsible for the awesome mechanical swishing star from Kirby Superstar, if you recall. Okay. The super mean mega computer from Kirby Robot Land. 
that was trying right, to corporatize right. the planet, and our good pal Megalore. Mm. Then we have the magic race of ancients. Also, it subtly hints that the science ancients were from Earth, which is now a frozen barren wasteland, as seen in Kirby's Return to Dreamland. Sorry, Kirby 64 and the Crystal Shards. So there's a planet called Shiver Star, which is just Earth frozen over. Huh. So we that have... was another game I didn't play all the way through. But anyways, go on. So, we have these two races, and the science race was winning against the magic race. So the magic race gathered together all the darkness in the universe and created dark matter as a super weapon, which nearly wiped everybody out. Mm. So a lot of the things you find in Kirby are actually weapons made by the science race to fight dark matter. Like the dream wand is actually a super advanced science crystal that converts emotion into energy. Huh. Megalore's crown was a horrifying science crystal. And there's a few horrifying science crystals you find that are used to try and fight this dark energy and after you defeat it, it always reforms because it's an ethereal eldritch being. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Kirby's Dream Land 3 for the Super Nintendo had this, like, incredibly adorable, uh, like, uh, pencil crayon art style. Uh, it's, in terms of art style, it's it's probably one of my favorite games. It kind uh, of... In the Kirby series. <clears throat> I always but, kind of uh, saw it to be like, it was pixel art, but it almost looked like watercolors. Yeah, some like pixel art, watercolors, pencil crayons is just like it, it's definitely <clears throat> it was a very deliberate art style choice, uh, which I, I found find to be incredibly uh, endearing. Um, so it turns out. Then, oh, go ahead. But, but then you, you, you save all the little people with their little problems like you have to, you have to, you know, uh, not crush the flowers or water some other flowers or or sweep the sweep the dust off the ground and. Or like find the little stuffed doll for this one little girl, and it's like, yeah. So you complete all these like mini challenges. So return you can Samus's the boss. helmet. Just have to interject <laughs> that you return Samus's helmet from Metroid, <laughs> just cause. But continue. <laughs> but so you're like playing through this like cutesy Kirby game, and then you get to the end, and it is just this like black eyeball like uh, Galaga like side-scrolling space shooter game boss fight where you're fighting this creepy like eldritch eyeball <laughs> yeah so <laughs> apparently like, oh. gluey your sidekick in that game gooey gluey gooey uh gooey gooey is his name for sure thank you not to be confused with gluey the cleric of jublix from my curse of strahd campaign <laughs> very similar aesthetics though so it turns out he's a piece of dark matter that got separated and became sentient and then got purified by good emotions so he's a piece of evil that was chaotic, that was given sentience and order and became Kirby's friend. Uh, another side note about that game in particular uh, is that uh, Gooey as a sidekick, uh, like you can obviously play single player and you can make Gooey as a sidekick controlled by the by the computer, but I'm pretty sure that's the first example of Kirby multiplayer. Not the best example, but the first example. And it was actually pretty revolutionary and awesome for the time. I mean, I think part of our iconic with Kirby games, and this may apply to both of us equally, feel free to interject, is it's a co-op game and 99% of my Kirby experience is playing with you or Kirby Air mm. Ride. And when mm -hmm. you play it one player, it's just not as good, I tend to find. And it's not like being co-op is actually particularly helpful. It's the game has such a good pacing that a lot of platformers, if you try and make them co-op, you actually have one player bubble while the other one jumps through, and it's almost like you're taking turns, but on the same time, because if you both play at the same time, you'll just kill each other. Where Kirby feels uh, much more like you can actually work together without <laughs> ruining each other's lives. Well, I mean, that's, that's kind of uh, one of the uh, design principles of Kirby, where uh, Kirby can just, like, fly. So the game has never, ever really been about... Uh, platforming it's always been about uh, exploration um, so when you compare that to a game like uh, Super Mario Bros U or the new Super Mario Bros in general or Donkey Kong um, Tropical Freeze shout out to Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze yeah Do Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze was also pretty like uh, I love Tropical Freeze but for the most part uh, the second player was just better off riding on the first player's back uh, or, uh, as, as Richard said, um, 
in the Mario games, uh, the second player is often better just bubbling and floating through the difficult challenges. Although, although that's hilarious uh, when you're in bubble form and uh, the other player accidentally pops your bubble. But uh, Man, though. And Kirby, Kirby, Kirby games that have multiplayer, uh, in general, uh, I was not super impressed with the the Star Allies game multiplayer, but uh, in general, Kirby games just are uh, much more free form uh, and less dangerous platforming, so it's easier for cooperative multiplayer. And I mean, to segue on that, I recently watched a speed run of Kirby Air Ride. Of Kirby Air Ride? And I feel like you have a ton of questions about how one speed runs Kirby Air Ride. See, Kirby Air Ride has three modes. Mode A, meh. Mode B, meh. Mode C. What are the best Battle Royale racing challenge mini game co-op versus concophony creations ever forged? Um, well, okay, so, so let's step this back for a moment here. Uh, to anyone who is unfamiliar with the Kirby series, it is in general uh, a side-scrolling platformer uh, in which the main character is a, a pink cloud-like creature that can fly. Which, as I mentioned, makes the platforming challenges not particularly difficult, but adds a lot of exploration. To um, follow up on that Kirby, note... Oh. Kirby Air Ride, however, is a uh, single-button racing game uh, where... Per, does every single button just just drive? Is that, that how that there works? There is no drive button. I know the A button or the triggers, they both drive. But there, anyway, there is no drive button in Kirby Air Ride. You don't take your foot off the gas because they wisely figured out that most racing games, you're just holding down the gas the whole time anyway because braking's for chumps. So the only button is a combination brake, charge, attack button, which will then pause you, shoot an attack if you have one equipped, eat an enemy, or you can use it to kind of drift around corners. And you can also tap left and right on the analog stick really fast to do like a spin attack. Because who's going to not drive around in the racing game? So they gave you a brake button and put every other function onto it and called it a day. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, one of Kirby's vehicles throughout the, the series is called the Warp Star, which is basically just a star that you know warps around really fast. Uh, and the Kirby Air Ride is uh, a, a battle royale racing game based on Kirby riding around on an Air Star, on the Warp Star. One of the main, like, Anyways, now oh. you can continue with, with your description of uh, the nondescript mode A, the nondescript mode B, and then the apparently super awesome mode C. So the super awesome mode C involves four players driving around a city collecting power-ups, items, and things. And the premise <laughs> is that like you'll get like attack up, speed up, you'll find new warp stars like a shadow star that hits harder, or a milk crate that's nearly indestructible. And it'll tell you about halfway through a prediction. Like, they'll be like, expect a drag race at the end, or maybe you'll have to fight a battle, boss battle. And then at the end, unless the game lied to you, which it occasionally does, you fight the challenge it hinted at. So say me and Carl are driving around. He's like, I'm on a float star. It can have amazing air distance. I'm like, well, I'm on a motorbike, which doesn't go through the air at all. It's a motorbike. And then the hint in the middle says, expect to fly very far for the contest, so I'll be like, oh, it's probably a who can glide for this contest. So I murder Carl's vehicle, so he can't win. I go find myself a vehicle with wings so I can win. And then meteorites start dropping on us for no reasons and aliens attack. It is a fantastic game. <laughs> and then the challenge, of course, because the game can lie to you, I'm like, okay, I got a flight star, I destroyed Carl's flight star, I'm feeling pretty good. It'll be like, drag race, as Carl's just sitting in a rocket, be like, ha ha! <laughs> as our lives typically work that way. But, uh, so the speed run, so one of the things the game did is that a massive grid, and when you achieve something, it just light up a square on the grid, and they'd have various objectives. Apparently, mm -hmm. to get the end credits of the, that mode, you have to complete 100 things on the grid. So the speed oh. run is trying to complete 100 things on this grid as fast as possible. So they do little exploits and things to try and rig the challenge at the end to be specific modes, and, spe and try and do as many little achievements as possible to try and beat the get these 100 achievements in under 90 minutes. And it's funny, because I watched the game stomp on his dreams, because no amount of planning can stop the game from just kicking you in the face because it does what it wants. So, he had one minigame he had left to beat to complete the 100 score. And mm -hmm. what happened was it gave him a prediction of the exact minigame. 
So he plays through, gets to it, and it lied to him. So to get a wrong prediction about the one minigame he needed to play, he calculated the odds were 1 in 500,000 or something for Ooh. the combination of effects to be denied that harshly. Because it took him over 10 tries to get the right minigame to appear with 1 in 3 odds. And then the last time it just straight up lied to him. <laughs> ah, but to pivot into another beautiful piece of Kirby entertainment, when I was growing up alongside some of these Kirby games, and part of what drew me into it was they did an animated series of, that touched on all that deep, deep Kirby lore. And this yeah. anime... Oh. Mm-hmm. Well, so so interesting, interestingly enough, uh, uh, Kirby right back at you is, is the North American localization. Uh, but to my knowledge, um, it is under lock and key. Uh, it is almost impossible to find. Uh, and I actually ended up watching uh, the majority of Kirby right back at you as the uh, as a uh, fan uh, sub from straight from Japanese. That's uh, fascinating. <laughs> but I think there's a hundred episodes or so, and they only ever managed to sub sixty. So, one so of the it's thing... like I've, I've only seen about two thirds of the show. Uh, but anyway, you can go on with what you were going to say about, about the. Oh, I was going to say, in right one of the you. best works of cross promotion I've ever seen in my life, the day Kirby Air Ride launched, they did a TV episode about Air Ride th- fiends stealing Kirby's Warp Star and just did an Air Ride themed episode to line up with the game release. Where they had <laughs> villains show up in all the different cars they were putting in the game. And I'm like, that's, that's how you cross promotion. I watched this on the Friday, and then your game came out on the Monday. Like, that was elegant. <laughs> so, on that note, though, like, Kirby has always had fantastic mini games as well, to the point where mm. recently me and you played a dedicated Kirby fighting game, which we do need to play more of at some point. Because <laughs> the platforming's uh, always yeah. been simple, so they doubled down on the combat. Yeah, um, the more modern Kirby games definitely um, have almost have uh, a complete fighting engine within the the, the platforming, um, which I, honestly I don't understand why more games don't take advantage of of platforming fighting games like just a straight up fighting game except for it's also a platformer like uh, Super Smash Bros Brawl. In which Kirby is also a character. The Actually, main Kirby's character. Been a character in Smash Bros. from the beginning. Kirby is the main character of Smash Bros. <laughs> like, he literally is the only person who survived the end of the universe, because Kirby may have some of the highest stats of any character that's not in DC, Marvel, or is a Dragon Ball Z god above gods. Like, Kirby is a top tier. He went through a frying uh, pan with a monster in it to the sun and back. Uh, shout out to... Uh, the. <clears throat> the death battle on, screw on attack. YouTube. Uh, I'm not sure if it was screw attack at the time. I mean, now, I now they're they affiliated now. with rooster teeth. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, regardless, uh, they did a, uh, I would say most likely accurate uh, fight between Kirby uh, as a pink blob and uh, super, well, no, uh, kid boo. Majin that, boo. Just, that... It was chonky boo. It, 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 well, it was chonky boo. Oh yeah. Okay. Who anyway, rates as, like, it the 10th strongest DBZ character. At the time, he was probably the 4th strongest. <laughs> Kirby versus Boo, and uh, Kirby annihilated him. As he should. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, yeah. Now nah, I forget where we were going with that. Well, I was going to give a brief shout out to Kirby Superstar Ultra for the DS, where they took a fantastic Kirby game. And then I was going to pivot into uh, Kirby right. mini games, but yeah. Right, right. The Kirby mini games. Uh, I'm kind of uh, sad they have yet to add Kirby to Mario Kart because it's such an obvious addition. But maybe that's foretelling that I'm going to get a new air ride. Oh, no, maybe. Uh, but the the Kirby Fighter game for the DS, uh, they actually released a standalone version of it. But it definitely just started as a uh, as one of the mini games, and has uh, now developed both into its own game and uh, has become more uh, central to the gameplay mechanics of the main series. They also which is put actually in pretty cool. That like Kirby uh, boss battle game I, as well. Uh, yeah, the Kirby Clash, I think it was. Yeah, where they tried to 
they put some freemium nonsense in it, which is unfortunate, because the idea of a four-man squad where you kill Kirby bosses to get gear, kind of like Monster Hunter, that has a certain appeal to my heart. Had they fleshed that out to being a full game rather than a freemium yeah. game, that would have got my cash yeah. money. Uh, but I, uh, I definitely, like, Kirby Star Allies, uh, was a disappointment to me because, uh, they added this new multiplayer mechanic that basically did not function in a multi multiplayer fashion. It was like, oh, you get to form a little bridge for people to try and get an enemy across so that he can carry a key. Uh, but uh, then only one of the players actually needs to control the bridge, and the other players are generally a detriment, which kind of loops back around to the whole point about uh, how difficult it is to design a co-op platformer, I suppose. Yeah, where when we look uh, at Kirby Superstar, they had their minion arena where me and Carl would each just pick a different minion and fight our way through a gauntlet of co-op glory. That's beautiful design. Yeah, or uh, the uh, Great Cave Offensive is probably like the best, best they... Kirby uh, sub game. It came so close the, to being the, a I... full Metroidvania. <laughs> yeah, you, the Great Cave Offensive is basically you have a list of of treasures that you find in this giant open, well, not open world, but it's well, a pretty open world a for a Kirby game, like. <laughs> like mm -hmm. for a two D platformer, yeah. it's. A bit, well, it's about as open world as you're going to get, honestly. Like, you can go in pretty much any direction. Yeah. And then there's, like, secret paths and secret doors and and then, obviously, hidden treasures, and it's, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, one of my favorite puzzles in it, because it was so esoteric, is you have to have one ally be a fire enemy so they can float underwater to light a fuse because their head's on fire while it's underwater. <laughs> yeah. Uh... I uh, I definitely um, I'm looking forward to another Kirby game, which hopefully uh, they remove the non-cooperative multiplayer mechanics and just focus more on awesome secrets and uh, power combinations. Because yeah, the new and, uh, Kirby game that was announced that is effectively Kirby meets Breath of the Wild is his first jump to a full 3D exploration open world game, and Part of me is hoping there's a secret two-player mode where I push start and we just net play and go both explore this world together. But I'll take one player if their focus is on the exploration. Uh, yeah, like the, that new Kirby game does look pretty awesome. Kirby 64 came, like, it felt like it was going to be so close to being 3D. And then they're just like, yeah, no, it's it's, it's 2.5D. Yeah, but... 3D uh, models in a 2D world. They did have 3D mini games, weirdly, though. Because Kirby loves oh, to put was... in multiplayer minigames to make sure that you get some value for your buck. Like, they're very high-value, high-dense games. They're like, oh, some games will just release this one-player campaign. But we made sure to put in a samurai log-cutting minigame. <laughs> yeah, uh, Kirby games are definitely densely packed with content. Like, I have yet to feel like I've got more value for my bucks than Kirby Superstar DS. Because I just kept unlocking modes, and then it's like, you unlock the true arena, and then they, you unlock the real true arena, we mean it this time. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty confident that had wrapped up. <laughs> like, even the Kirby Golf game for the NES is still playable. <laughs> uh, the... It's not... Kirby uh, Dream Course? Word. Dream Course, yeah, yeah. Kirby Dream Course is a fantastic game, although also... Uh, like it is definitely Kirby has all Kirby enemies and Kirby himself is uh, a definitely a, a, an excellent golf ball which is kind of the whole point it's like you, instead of playing a platformer uh, it's basically like a, a puzzle mini golf, golf kind of you, thing you, you shoot your Kirby and you try to hit enemies to grab powers and then use the powers to try and hit more enemies to grab more powers to see how quickly you can get to the hole uh, which appears when the last enemy, uh, when you're down to one enemy, they turn into into the the hole for the course, and whoever can get to the hole for the course in fewer uh, strokes, ultimately wins. Which is just it's a pretty cool game. Oh yeah, and with that, I think this seems like an excellent time to wrap up today's episode. So, 
Our random dragon question will take me a moment to find. Give me a second here. So in the meantime, talk about Kirby things while I look up this question. Uh, well, uh, Kirby's epic yarn, uh, that's, that's another, uh, very interesting, uh, Kirby game for, for art artistic choice. Um, a lot of people don't necessarily like epic yarn, uh, because it's not super Kirby. It's, it's a platformer, but it definitely tries to take the game in, in substantially different directions. Fair uh, but I, I have to say, like, that's one of the things that I really like about Kirby in general is that they definitely have a very uh, artistic style, uh, which uh, means that they can focus more on, on the gameplay than uh, on making it uh, pixel perfect, I guess. Fair enough. So, with that vamping successfully done... For your chance to win a free digital copy of the Waltz of Blades Deluxe, feel free to submit your random dragon question and random question of the week. So for this week's random dragon question, what is the difference between a dragon and a griffin? What is the difference between a dragon and a griffin? Ooh. Um. <clears throat> well, I mean, I was going to say that uh, griffins don't breathe fire. Although I suppose not all dragons breathe fire. And also, Although some it, it, griffins it do common. breathe fire. What? Really? Oh, yeah. Like, I've definitely seen crests where it'll be like a beak opened up and there'll be like a flame. Hmm. I, I guess you could probably make an argument that the... Well, no, he's a sphinx. In, in, I was thinking, thinking Super Mario Land where you have to fight... Yeah, the king. Uh, he kind of looks like a griffin, but, but he ends up actually being... He's actually a sphinx. So it's like, oh, yeah, he breathes fireballs, but no. I mean, my brain always gets griffins and sphinxes. Like, they're very similar in aesthetic, so I can see that mix-up for sure. I like to think that dr that griffins are the platypuses of dragons, where, you're like, they're a mammal for some reason, but they have feathers and a beak and lay eggs. Like, griffins are the platypuses of dragons, where a real dragon is lizard through and through. Although we did have a debate whether or not dragons would be feathered. Uh, well, I mean, evolutionarily, uh, a lot of raptors... Uh like from like uh, dinosaur times I, I uh, don't want to be inaccurate but um, <clears throat> a lot of modern day birds evolved from uh, feathered dinosaurs and also Yoshi iconically can grow feathered wings <laughs> huh. I'd never really thought about that yeah so I'm gonna say that griffins are not a dragon but much like how a platypus is not a bird, I can see the confusion in the overlap. So I'm just going to call griffins platypus <laughs> dragons. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I guess I would agree with that. I don't. I think you're going to have to find me a more concrete example of a, of a griffin that breathes fire. That does seem like a challenge, and unfortunately, I'll probably end up with some weird monster hunter creature. You'd be like, no, no, no. That's does that's not an actual griffin. Because Monster Hunter's like, <laughs> take animal, add dragon, call it new creature. Like the beautiful Toby Kadashi, the electric squirrel winged dragon. Or, or the Nargakuga, the panther bat dragon. So I think with each new iteration of dragons and where wyverns and things, I think the distinctions actually become thinner and thinner between dragon and griffin as we reach like fantasy monster singularities. Like one of the new D&D <laughs> supplements has a mind flayer dragon. Ooh. Which, light spoilers to any D&D players that are reading this, at some point I will attack you with a Mind Flayer Dragon. Uh-oh. But with that, my the PDF of the Waltz of Blades goes out, and for our random question of the week, if you could only listen to one video game soundtrack as your only source of music for the rest of your life, what video game would it be? Uh, for me, it would in fact be Kirby's Dream Land 3 for the Super Nintendo. Uh, <clears throat> there, there's a lot of nostalgia there. Uh, it kind of has a, a, a you know, chiptune uh, style of music. But it's also uh, just... <clears throat> it's very mellow, uh, and uh, but like light and happy at the same time. And that's, that's kind of where I like to be, light, happy, and mellow. See, where I run into a problem here 
is when I write, I tend to put a soundtrack that fits the scene I'm writing. So a lot of my novel is written to the Mega Man Zero soundtrack, because mm. it is fantastic. But a lot of my studying will be done to something jazz-esque. So, weirdly, mm. I think the soundtrack that covers both those extremes best is actually Donkey Kong Country 2. Where it has such a variety. Ooh. Like, they have the soothing water stage melody, but the intense bees are going to murder you. I think gives me a balance I'm going for. So, <laughs> with that, our PDFs are sent out, and I want to give a shout-out to Retro Remix Review for our background Kirby Jazz that's been playing this episode. And I want to thank everybody for tuning in this week to Richard and Carl Presents Deep Space and Dragons. DS and D. Thanks again for listening, and I hope you guys have a great unspecified time period. Bye! <laughs>